Good afternoon, and welcome to the first E1 Tech Talk, a series created to share knowledge and inspiration with tech entrepreneurs through a variety of perspectives. Our aim is to encourage, empower, and equip entrepreneurs on a path toward success. I'm Susan Langer, founder and CEO of Live, Give, Save, a FinTech for Good launched out of Red Wing Ignite, where I also serve as an entrepreneur advocate. Thank you so much for joining us today. It looks like we have quite the crowd. Um, Jamie, how many people have signed up now? I think we had around 32 it was, so that's exciting. Um, a couple housekeeping items. You'll see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. That's where you can submit questions and we'll answer those um, during the interview and at the end of the interview. Um, you'll also see some pop-up polls from time to time. Um, we want to understand who's listening, and we also need to get data um, to appease our grant reporting requirements. And you know how that goes, no data, no money. <laughs> so before um, I introduce our illustrious speaker, I'd like to take this opportunity to share a little bit about our E1 partnership, who we are, what we stand for, and hopefully to entice you to come back and to hear more from our future guests. Um, E1 Tech Talks uh, will occur um, each month on the last Thursday of the month um, at 2 p.m. E1 stands for Entrepreneurs First. We look at everything through the lens of the entrepreneur. It's also an ecosystem designed to enhance regional connectivity among builders and stakeholders in 11 counties within Southeast Minnesota. Our 14 partners that you see here on your screen provide entrepreneurs with access to a variety of resources and powerful networks to strengthen and grow their business. From co-working space and technical assistance to higher ed and the all important funding. E1 was inspired by and is funded through Governor Waltz's Launch Minnesota Initiative, a statewide collaborative effort to accelerate the growth of startups and amplify Minnesota as a national leader in innovation. Moreover, Launch Minnesota is led by our own Neela Molgard, a former executive director of Red Wing Ignite. Now for the reason why we're all here. I am so, so, so excited to introduce our guest. A major thanks to Dr. Christine Beach, the executive director of Kabara Institute at St. Mary's University. She's also an E1 partner and board member of Launch Minnesota. Thank you, Christine, for securing our first eTalk Tech guest, e-tech talk guest, Lisa Lavin. Lisa Lavin is founder and CEO of OwnCare, a subsidiary of uh, Answer Innovation. OwnCare is a digital health company pioneering products that enable remote care. OwnCare extends the reach of caregivers and redefines me uh, medication adherence. Lisa has over 25 years of experience building new business from the ground up within the healthcare and high tech sectors. Lisa is active in local and national organizations that support entrepreneurialism and women in business. Lisa is a Minnesota Cup division winner, Eureka Award winner for innovation, was recognized by Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal as one of 25 women to watch, Minnesota Business Real Power 50, and the New York Observer's 2020 list of hottest flyover tech companies in digital health. Wow, <laughs> you have been busy and have a lot to show for it, Lisa. So thank you, Lisa Levin, for joining E Tech Talk. My pleasure, thank you. So you've had a number of successful startups. I'd be curious to know what your path was in becoming um, an entrepreneur. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, I, I love, um, you know, Red Wing, the Winona area, because that's actually where I got my start. Um, I come from a long line of entrepreneurs. I'm actually probably a third or fourth generation. And from my earliest memory, I've wanted to own my own business. I remember uh, when I was around eight, 10 years old, I would spend hours as a kid sitting in my grandfather's business, which was a beverage distribution company. And I'd be 30 feet in the air on top of three levels of pallets of beer eating a pickled sausage and soda that the salesperson brought in <laughs> and watching my grandpa's operation from the forklifts going all over the place and loading up trucks and 
and watching my grandfather's relationship that he had with everybody from the forklift driver to the salespeople to the owners of businesses in the community. It was just really inspiring to watch. And ever since that time, I've been trying to figure out what is my thing? What am, what am I going to develop? And given a long winding road that's been my path along the, on the way, I finally founded my first company in 2011. It's been a wild ride ever since. And which company was that? That first company was Answer Innovation, which is a technology company developing a platform of products that enable remote care. And since then, we've actually uh, founded two separate companies as wholly owned subsidiaries of Answer that leverage a technology platform for remote care in two separate market verticals. So Ohm Care, and then I saw something like uh, Pet Chats. Yeah, that was actually our first product line and our first company that we did. What we were trying to do is develop this audiovisual interface to be able to communicate, interact with somebody that maybe wasn't good with technology and also do remote dispense. Mm. And so Pet Chats was all about a digital daycare system for the home alone pet. It allows me to interact with him and give him treats, um, stream dog TV, all of these things. This was a testing ground for us to be able to develop this technology platform to ultimately then rinse and repeat it into the healthcare vertical, which was always part of our plan from the onset of, of forming Answer Innovation was to get into healthcare with an in-home uh, remote care hub of care, as well as medication dispenser. So how did you balance that vision then? So you had this bigger vision and then you came to market with a, a real unique singular focus. How were you able then to get your investors to invest in that, but then to believe in your, your ultimate vision? That is a great question. And that was really, really hard um, because in the state of Minnesota, especially um, we are, we're very big into healthcare. We're very big into medical device. There's a lot of investors that that is their focus and that's really their passion. Mm -hmm. And so when you're trying to sell a vision of the future that this technology, this technology platform we're developing now is going to turn into something else in the future, they were like, yeah, but I don't really like pet. Why are you doing this with pet? <laughs> and, but it, thank God we did, because I will tell you what, we made a lot of mistakes along the way, just as, as any startup would do. Luckily, none of them lethal. <laughs> um, but, but we were able to make those mistakes and perfect the technology whereby then in 2017, we started developing the medication management system, which is now known as OMCARE. However, back in 2011, we started writing patents. So we now have three issued patents for OMCARE and other patents that are pending. So we've, we, this vision has, we've been working on it for a really long period of time and cutting our teeth on pet chats. And I will just add is that we're now in the process of exiting the Pet Chats business where that business will be acquired by another company who's going to focus on it. Oh, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. So how long was it from the time that you um, filed your patent until you actually got it approved? Because I know that there's sometimes a number of times that they reject it before they'll finally approve it. Yeah, it is quite a long process. Um, for each individual pat patent, I would say it probably took a good three years per patent to be able to get it um, to where the examiner would be looking at it and we can start, you know, kibitzing back and forth. Um, and then finally for it to be published, um, probably three to four years per patent. And we have a question from the audience here. Have you had to defend your patents ever? No, we have not. But I will say this about patents. It is true that your patents are as good as your ability to defend them. Mm -hmm. Since our product isn't in market yet, Ohm Care, um, then there's, there's really no reason to defend any patents since we're not out there yet. So um, a little bit on the investors again. So how long did it take you and how many investors did you talk to, Lisa, before you actually got somebody to say, I believe in you? So, um, well, first of all, I will just say that I've probably done well over 500 pitches um, in front of people in my career in this since 2011. It's, it's, a, it's a long haul. It's really, really hard. 
Um, and what I've learned along the way is really to understand who our investor is, um, because before I was using a shotgun and now I'm able to use a rifle. We also have more traction, so it's easier to raise money now because they know who you are and they know that I do what I say I'm going to do. Um, so, you know, we have less than um, less than 100 um, angel investors that have invested over $9 million to date in our development um, on our platform. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you sure did. That's, that's amazing. Good for you. Um, I want to know a little bit more about um, your grit and your perseverance um, part of it. Um, share a little bit. Um, maybe you can share a story with us that when you were ready to give up, you just wanted to throw your hands in the air and just say, damn it, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. But you didn't. You dug in. What happened? How did you feel? How did you recover? What did you learn? Oh, my goodness sakes. We just don't even have time to tell all of the <laughs> stories that demanded perseverance and grit. And it happens every single day. I mean, COVID-19 is another example. It's like, are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> a global pandemic now <laughs> or ever? Oh, my gosh. Um, so there is a particular instance that I recall, and um, this was <laughs> this was a very trying time. Um, it, raising money is hard. We were just on that subject, and it was a particular time. It was about probably five years ago. I had I had put together this deal with this angel investor in this small group, and it was a pretty big chunk of money that was going to come in that was going to give us a pretty long runway, and it was just awesome. And I was so excited about it. I worked over a year on this thing. And, you know, it, it was pretty much a done deal. I mean, it was a done deal. All the papers were signed. Um, you know, money was in a repository and, you know, things were sailing along. So I decided for the first time in a very long time, I was going to take a weekend off. Oh, and yeah. so I and a, and a few friends, we went to Wisconsin and we we're staying in this, this uh, little resort air thing. And I'll never forget, it was Saturday morning and my phone rang and it was my attorney. And he said, Lisa, the deal fell through. And I was like, I mean, my jaw literally probably hit the bathroom counter. I just couldn't understand what happened. Well, he explained, it was horrible. It was just horrible. I mean, it was just devastating. The deal was gone. I walked out of the bathroom. I walked out in front of my friends. I told him what happened and I was just like, all right, how do you spin this all positive? I mean, what do you do with this? And luckily the people that I was traveling with were a couple of them were psychotherapists. Thank God. I, I recommend traveling with psychotherapists as much as you possibly can <laughs> because one of my dear friends said this to me, which I carry to this date. She said, Lisa, you've likely just been saved from something and the next thing is the best thing. Mm -hmm. And it was that that I just, I grabbed onto with my fingernails because it was all I had. The next thing is the best thing. It took me about a year to be able to, oh, no, sorry, about six months to be able to get an other avenues of capital to be able to get us to the next point. Um, but it was one of the hardest things. So there was two lessons that I learned. One is the next thing is the best thing. When bad things happen and they do all the time, there's a blessing in it. The next thing is the best thing. And the other thing that I learned is always, always, always have plan B and have plan C. Because plan A oftentimes doesn't work out and you're just not as devastated when it doesn't work out if you have plan B and C. Right. So I always do now. I often have said if I ever had another company, I would name it just plan B. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That, we have a couple other questions here. Eric Baud wants to know, do you have any regrets, regrets about working with investors when would you recommend working with investors versus bootstrapping? Well, you know, it depends on what you want to do and what kind of scale you want to want to be at. Um, sometimes you can bootstrap and you can create a business um, that uh, doesn't require a huge capital. Um, it is slower. Um, and if you have to invest in like technology development and so on and so forth, it does get harder to do that. We needed large sums of money. I mean, the, the first development of Pet Chats was, the first round was well over a half a million dollars just to get um, the basic design. It wasn't even finalized then. I had spent another half a million dollars to redevelop it because it was done wrong the first time. I mean, there's so many stories I could tell you. So <laughs> it, 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 
when, when people said to me, Lisa, it's going to take you twice as much money and twice as much time, I went, ah, that's for other people. <laughs> oh, no, for me, it was three times as much money and three times as much time. Seriously, it was terrible. Look, it takes a lot of money to build a business that is scalable enough to go national and potentially global. That's why. So, wow. but what, here's what I will say. Um, our focus has been to, if, as much as and as long as we possibly can, stick with angel dollars versus venture capital or other kind of dollars that are more dilutive and more controlling. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Um, here's another question. There's a lot of hype about um, hype for a product line in Om Care, especially since COVID-19. How do you plan to get Om Care into the homes of seniors once the product launches? Yeah, that's a great question. I will tell you that's one of the positive things um, that have come from COVID-19 is it has, it has put a shine to spotlight on the need for remote care, on the need for technology that enables extending the reach of caregivers into the home. Um, and so we're really excited about that. Um, our, our business model is both a B2B as well as a B2B, B2C business model. But our focus primarily is on what we're going to be piloting with our pilot partners, Ecumen and Thrifty White Pharmacy later on this year. Ecumen, for example, as they are a senior healthcare company, okay? They have both facilities that provide assisted living um, and they are um, getting into being able to provide care in the home. So technology enables them to reach further into the home and develop those relationships and help people um, in their care model, whatever care they might need, especially like medication assistance, that common denominator that 99.9% .9 of all seniors take at least one medication, mm -hmm. usually on average about five medications. And so helping them do that. So this is a model that, that enables Ecumen to reach into homes now. Um, and so we will be selling through healthcare providers and extending their, their care model with technology. Fantastic. We need it for sure. Thank you. Um, and then we have another one here from Hinlin Hotran. Um, how much do you see as the point of affordable cost for your um, home care product? How much do you see as the point of affordable cost? What is the price point? I can't speak to price point yet. Um, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. But it, you know, it it is it is of a model. It is of a model that um, is this today. In order to make sure that somebody has real medication adherence, meaning they're taking the right medication at the right time, the right person, you have to show up at their door, hand them the medication, and watch them take it. That's what OmCare does remotely. We're able to deliver medication, and watch people take the medication and then be able to, you know, record that. Um, that is a huge cost savings. Yeah. Today, in order for somebody to have that service, to home delivery of medication delivered into their hands and watching them take it is over $100 a day. Our product will be paid for in less than a half of a month. It's mm -hmm. kind of like buying an iPhone for your mom that makes sure she's taking the right med at the right time to prevent being hospitalized, which is the leading cause of hospitalization of seniors is just not taking the right med at the right time. Right. So they have to have internet access, obviously. And is it through like an iPad or an iPhone or what is the... So uh, Ohm Care is a device that is sitting on your mom's kitchen counter or bedside table. And it's preloaded with up to a 30 day supply of medication. And I then have, as a caregiver, a familial caregiver or a professional okay. caregiver, have an app on my computer or my phone that I'm able to call her. And she's able to call me with a one touch of a button. Great. Um, that I can't wait for that to hit the market. Uh, will Kitchen wants to know, how do you think your company will fit into the post-pandemic reality for healthcare massively? <laughs> well, I've heard it actually stated recently. It's... Um, the, the genie has been let out of the bottle from a telemedicine perspective. For the very first time, all of a sudden, caregivers can provide care across state lines. For the first time, all of a sudden, telemedicine is now being reimbursed um, in new ways. And so what we are is we're a conduit for telemedicine in the home. We provide the technology platform for other people's care models. 
we made a decision very early on that we were not going to compete with healthcare providers, but rather we were going to partner with them and be a conduit for them into the home. So, you know, post COVID-19, the need for remote care to keep people safe and isolated, but yet cared for and connected uh, has become huge paramount issue and it's not going away. Um, we have a question here about from an entrepreneur, I'm guessing, what advice would you have for someone just starting out and looking to attract investors? So when an investor invests in a business, um, there's really two primary criteria that they consider. They consider the horse and they consider the jockey. Mm -hmm. So the jockey is, it's the leadership team. It's the leadership. Have you proven yourself historically? Do you have the chutzpah to make it happen? Have you proven yourself to have the wherewithal to make it happen? And do you have the right team and support around you, um, advisors included? And then the, the horse is the business model, it's the business plan. Those two things need to be really valid and validated, um, can, and be able to be validated by the investor. And that's what they really look at. And so if you can really get two, a, a good strong jockey and a good strong horse and prove it, you can raise money. Great, thank you. Another question came in, uh, does insurance cover some of the costs of own care? So because this is a new device, um, insurance reimbursement is often a lagging event, meaning you have to prove its clinical value before insurance companies will pay for it. Um, certainly we'll be able to be paid for using an HSA um, and that kind of thing, and certainly reimbursable we'll make it reimbursable in the, in the future. For sure, great. Um, so uh, getting to your legacy and your purpose as we were talking about earlier, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Simon Sinek says, only when, uh, why, how, and what are in perfect balance do we know who we are? Essentially what he's saying is that we need to discover and live our purpose. So what would you say is Lisa's purpose and why, and what's the moral of your story? That's, that's a great question. You know, I've, over the years, I've thought a lot about this. Um, I am a purpose-driven person. Um, what I do has to be meaningful and it has to be in alignment with my core values. Um, but ever since, ever since I was very early on in my career, matter of fact, within the first three years when my career started, I was thrust into academia. And I was, um, you know, teaching. Uh, vocational students, um, radiation physics, <laughs> and I was teaching them these really difficult things, and pharmacology, and, and I was be thrilled to be able to see these light bulbs go on in my students' eyes, and that led me then to being asked to write a textbook and being able to actually teach people on a global level, and all this while, and oh, by the way, that textbook is now in its seventh edition. It's used in, in schools globally, but this was it. My it was, I was just thrilled all the time, every day, by being able to help people reach their capacity, to be able to help them succeed. And I will say early on, um, I did this all on a two-year degree. I didn't have my four-year degree until I actually started getting into business. And all along, because of that, because I didn't have the credentials, everybody always asked you know and said you can't do that you don't have the direct the, the the credentials you're not qualified to to do what you are saying you're going to do and i would over and over and over again have to say yes i can watch me that i know is what so many people especially young entrepreneurs go through is people say you can't do that you're, it's not possible don't even try and my purpose has been and continues to be is to help people succeed. Mm -hmm. I see this with my team. I get no greater joy than seeing every member of my team reach their fullest potential and, and exhilarated at what they can accomplish as, as an individual. And my goal eventually is to be able to do this on a broader scale. My first job, job number one right now is to hit home care out of the ballpark. But my guess is, is that 
after that happens and we hit it out of the ballpark, I'm going to have a little bit more time to be able to help others succeed, especially those that have been told that they can't. Mm, I love that. Tell us a little bit about how you pick your team members and what qualities do you look for and how do you gauge whether or not, whether or not they have that. They might have experience in, in healthcare. They might have um, a lot of initials behind their name. How do you find the ones that can really go the distance um, in a startup? It all goes back to, it is when you measure a person, you measure them by not only their what and their why, but also their how. Um, we, we are very much a value-based organization. We do believe that, that, that uh, values eat strategy for lunch. Okay, our culture eats strategy for lunch. And so we hire, um, first of all, you know, that they're qualified credential-wise to do the job. But just as important is that they, they hold our core values um, as sacred as well, that, that they could be aligned with who and what we are as a culture. Um, and if they don't fit, I don't care how smart you are, we're not going to be able to hire you because our culture is most important to us. So... That's how we hire. That is awesome. I've got a couple other questions here. Are there HIPAA uh, considerations to your device? Oh, absolutely. Whenever you're talking about the exchange of, of patient health information, um, it, it, you have to be very careful and we're in compliance with all of the HIPAA regulations regarding that. Okay. How can people learn more about Ohm Care? Are you on social media? You know, the best source is to go to omcare.com, O-M-C-A-R-E.com. Um, that is a website that actually we're redeveloping right now and look for a brand new website that's going to be launching maybe in the next three months. Um, that's a great information. We're also on LinkedIn and Facebook and a growing, yeah, growing presence in all of those entities, social media entities. Okay, let's see here. We've got um, one from... Emily Cash, uh, your board of directors has some heavy hitting business women. How do their unique talents add to the overall mission of Ohm Care? I love that question because we were very intentional about who we had on our board. From my perspective, um, a board is about enabling our business strategy to be executed. So, and it has to balance out me and the other senior leadership team. So what we brought to the table in our board was, for example, Janine Rivet, the former CEO of Optum and United Healthcare. She brings to the table that big company, big healthcare company mindset. So as we're having those strategic partner conversations with those big companies, she can help us with those negotiations as well as those connections. I look at Amanda Brinkman, uh, the star of the small business revolution and the chief brand officer of Deluxe Corporation. Huge, brilliant marketing mind that is helping us put the right marketing strategies together to execute well. Jody Hubler, um, you know, she's the president of Bind On Demand Health Insurance, as well as the chief executive officer of Lemhi Ventures. She brings that not only health insurance, but also venture capital mind to the table when and if that does come to be so that we need that kind of, uh, that kind of dollars to the table. Mark Gingrich, the chief, chief the CIO of SureScripts, which is a company that manages all of the pharmacy information that is transferred between entities in our nation. And the list goes on. Um, all of those balance me and balance our ability to be able to execute on our business strategy. We're just, I feel blessed to have these guys at our How table. How did you attract that type of bench? That's amazing. Well, you know, um, here's what I would say. Good leadership compounds. Um, you have to be a good leader and be an intentional good leader to be able to track, attract other good leadership. And so every single time we brought other good leaders to the table, it just opened the, the door to more and more. Um, it certainly was hard in the beginning because I wasn't a known entity, let's say back in 2011. Um, but, but it is leadership, good leadership compounds. Did you, have you ever had to fire a board member? No comment. 
Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I have not. Right. Um, here's another question, a good one. Um, in order to, from uh, Hanlon again, in order to get into healthcare, uh, health tech while pursuing an MBA program, what do you recommend students do to assert themselves and build their credibility? I would like to found a health tech company, but unsure of the smartest way to tackle both entrepreneurship and healthcare. Love that. Well, um, first and foremost, what I would say um, is to surround yourself with, with smarter people than yourself. And I, I still do that to this day. Look at my board. I always try to surround myself with really, really smart people. Advisors, personal advisors. You might even consider having a personal uh, board of directors that will help guide and steer you to help make good decisions around next steps in business, next steps in education. Um, just next steps in your life. Um, I've, I've always been a fan of that model, but I, I, I always tend to, when I have ideas and I have lots of ideas, a lot is to vet those, vet those with smarter people than myself to get their feedback, to then ultimately be able to build a plan that is vettable by other business leaders, partners, and board members and investors. Fantastic, okay, we've got lots of questions here. People are engaged, I love that. Um, which EMRs are you integrating with? Are, uh, are they helping or are they integrating through a third party platform? So um, there's, there's a lot of um, EHRs out there, that is for certain, and um, so I can't speak to the exact ones that we're working on right now, but I will say that our intention is to be integrated with the, the large ones relevant to senior care as well as um, healthcare, you know, hospital based EMRs, EHRs. Okay. Um, if, if the founder is not an IT expert, what are the best ways to find IT experts? Uh, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Right. So you bring that talent to the table, um, it, whether it's in the advisory form or it's in a partner. What, here's what I found um, pretty early on is know what your core is of what you're going to develop, of what you're going to build and try to have that core on the inside. Case in point, when we first started developing Pet Chats, I decided very early on, we're gonna be a virtual organization. We're gonna outsource everything. And um, that's how we're gonna do it. So we'll just keep our balance sheet and our, our P&L really low and lean and flat. And we'll just pay for everybody on the outside to do it. Well, the problem was is the company that we had hired to develop that product, unfortunately, their core competency, they didn't have the core competency that we needed either. This was really all about software development and they had to outsource that software development too. Long story short, we ended up having to pull that project and completely redevelop Pet Chats all over again, raise a whole bunch more money to do it. And what I, what I came away with was this. What our core is in our company is software, it is customer care, and it is marketing. And we will always have that acumen on the inside. The other things such as mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, you know, contract manufacturing, we can always have that on the outside, but have, we, are always, we will always have the core on the inside. That is um, so important. I mean, when you're looking at outsourcing um, and, and purchasing that, I, I went through the same thing. And then bringing it in and building your team I mean, you have to have funding either way, but if you can control it, IT expenses though are so expensive in the U.S. versus if you um, purchase them offshore. Did you have to purchase offshore um, talent or um, did you have offshore talent yourself when you hired them or was it all um, from U.S. based? Well, first of all, I just want to make sure that I'm clear in what I'm speaking of. I'm speaking of software engineering, software development, not, not necessarily IT. Um, so just so I'm clear. Yep. So the, to answer that question from a software engineering perspective, I've tried everything. 
<laughs> I did try offshore for a little while. Um, that was useful to a point. Um, but you have to have really, really strong supervision um, to be able to make sure that they're doing what they say they're going to do within the time frame that they say they're going to do it in the budget they're going to say they're going to do it and make sure it's done right. And it's hard to control. And then I think about intellectual property. If you think about software as being our secret sauce and really a big part of our intellectual property, and I've got somebody in another country developing it, it does beg the question, is it safe? And is what is the risk when you do outsource something like that that is so meat and potatoes part of what you're, what you're doing? So be careful, be cautious. Know that you must know that this company is reputable and you must have to have some assurances that your intellectual property is safe. Yeah, that's key. What would, I know we have a number of students um, that are watching and what would you give to them or, or what advice do you have for them as far as what studies they should focus on and how they could actually engage the entrepreneurship mindset within whatever role um, that they go into when they um, graduate? <laughs> So here's what I would say, you know, learn as much as you possibly can, both in school and outside of school. Um, look, even though you go to school for one particular subject doesn't mean that that is going to be your path. There's going to be lots of off ramps that you're going to encounter. There's, you're going to make, take a right turn when you thought you were for sure going to be taking a left turn. And that's okay. All roads and all paths lead to ultimately where you should end up and where, where you were meant to be, if you will, where your passion and where your soul is bringing you, right? So I would worry less about, you know, all of these critical decisions. Am I taking the right classes, the right coursework? But it is all about really that power of intention, that intentional mindset. Put your dreams out there. Put them on paper, talk to people about them, get involved in community organizations that are in the area of your interest. If you're interested in being an entrepreneur, get involved in those student entrepreneurial organizations. And then once you graduate, get involved with like the Minnesota Cup and organizations like Launch Minnesota and all, all of these other things, E1 Tech, um, and get engaged because it's that community that will help you be sm smarter and get to where you want to go faster. Fantastic advice. That's awesome. Um, and then we have from Dan Q says to Lisa, how do you navigate talents that can do things that you have no expertise in? And how can you evaluate that they're doing good work if you don't have the expertise in that? That's a good question. Oh, it's awesome. Um, that was especially hard in the very beginning when um, we had software engineers, especially on the outside, and I had no idea who, well, if they were developing anything right, because I don't know how to software develop. Um, and there, therein was another really um, a strong proponent of having an advisor, um, even if it's somebody that you contract to be the observer, to be the one that is making sure that has the wherewithal and the knowledge of whatever you're developing, software, whatever, that understands that space that can keep an eye on it for you. You've got to have somebody that is keeping an eye on it for you. Otherwise, you just have no idea what's happening. How do you get um, the continuous feedback loop of the um, customer experience? How do you set that up? Because that's so important to get that feedback for future innovation. Um, you know what? we are a voice of customer driven organization. I am a voice of customer driven person, meaning that um, it's, it's been part of my blood ever since I worked at 3M Healthcare. Um, I, I became a black belt trained in design for Six Sigma, which was all about letting the voice of customer lead and guide you. And so you have to be intentional around that. For example, when I first uh, was thinking about founding Answer Innovation, um, it was based on the fact that we had these patents around this pet phone thing. And that's how we were going to start. And I, you know, this was back in 2010. There was nothing else that existed like it on the market. So I thought, well, I got to figure out if somebody's going to buy this. 
So I started doing my own voice of customer. I started doing my own focus panels with pet parents. I started analyzing the intellectual property that existed today. And I started building a business plan that we could rinse and repeat into healthcare. The bottom line is this, all along the way, we always continue to tap into the voice of customer to make sure that A, we're designing right, we're building a product that somebody will buy, and then eventually we're gonna market in such a way that will be compelling and they will buy it. So you have to do touch points all along the way to make sure that you're doing these things right. Customer has to be deeply involved. Great, thank you. So you talked a lot about your dad and your grandfather as inspiring you when you were young. Tell us a little bit more about who else inspires you? Who is it that you look to to um, give you, um, yeah, inspiration? Yeah, I tell you what, I, I'm inspired by, by so many people. I mean, you know, of course, you know, there's the big names, right? Which don't need to be mentioned about those kind of inspirations. Um, but I will say, that today, and I, I'm going to get misty, um, I am inspired most by my team. Mm -hmm. I am inspired most by every single thing that they accomplish every single day, just today. So we have, um, we use Agile Scrum mm -hmm. in our product development process. And we have a Scrum every single day, just a touch point, 15 minutes. The whole team is there to see how the engineers are doing. We've got six, soon to be seven engineers on our team that are just developing software. And there was a big success today, right? And when those kind of things happen, when you've been working on something so painstakingly, sweat, blood, tears, to get something developed that has never been done before, um, and you see that happen, there's nothing that inspires me more or gives me greater joy and that kind of thing. So today I'm just, I am so inspired by every single team member that we have. Well, you touched on my, on my last question, which is what is it that you do that gives you the greatest joy? I mean, it's exhausting being an entrepreneur. I mean, just when you were talking about, you took one weekend off, yeah. you, know, you never get time off. What is it though that you do, Lisa, that fills up your soul, replenishes your spirit, gives you, you reliably know that it's going to bless you? So, you know, I do get a lot of joy from what I do, right? Um, but outside of work, um, you know, people may not know this about me, but I, I'm a tree hugger. I go into the woods. What people don't also realize is I'm an introvert. So, but I function all day long as an extrovert. And by the end of the day, I'm a pumpkin. <laughs> so I've got to recharge by myself generally. And I go to the woods usually to do that. My favorite thing off, most people don't know this about me is I'm a shed hunter and people have go, what you mean you look for little small metal no <laughs> no I look for antlers that fall off that are shed in the very early spring by male deer up until the age age five and so what I like to do is I like to go into the woods and I follow deer trails trails through the woods and I look for sheds and this is really it's a spiritual journey it's a quest Mm -hmm. if you will, that is a silent quest all by myself um, that is also fun. So what do you do with the sheds? Well, well <laughs> you're starting to collect. <laughs> so, I'm going to have to start giving some away, I think. I don't know. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to make the furniture and I'm not going to make the lamps out of antlers. I'm not, I promise. I'm not, not going to do it. A <laughs> um, couple more questions here. Um, how do you evaluate uh, which LinkedIn requests to accept or decline? Oh, yeah, I wish somebody had an answer for me on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, so here's what I will do. I will, I will tell you what I was taught kind of early on um, by a LinkedIn expert is if people have taken the time to personalize an invitation that seems relevant to you, um, in some way or form, then those are the kind of connections that you want to make. Mm -hmm. um, the other ones are, are just a little bit more difficult. I've, I've, I've spent time, I have made the mistake of accepting a lot that end up being kind of like spamish. Um, so I, you know, that is what it is. But you know, it's hard though. I, I tend toward just accepting because if I, again, if I can help in any way, I certainly will. Right, that's great. 
And then Hannah uh, Worku has a question. If you knew COVID-19 was coming, what would you have done differently? How does this pandemic change your perception of risk slash uncertainty? So the good news is, is there's, there, first of all, there was, there's no way to, that we could have forecast all. There was a lot of experts out there that were forecasting we were going to eventually have a pandemic. Um, <clears throat> here's the good news of what we had in place. We had already established systems and processes to be able to work remotely. So on March 16th, when we decided we're going to go remote, March 17th, we did that without a hiccup. Our, my biggest concern was making sure that we had the right cadence and processes in place that we were able to maintain connection and maintain momentum. Mm -hmm. We have a really strong secret sauce as a team and I didn't want to lose it if we were to go remote. Um, so we, we, the good news is, is we were able to do all of that pretty much without a hiccup. Um, if I hadn't had that kind of planning, if we didn't have the systems and processes to be able to work remotely, um, then I probably would be kicking myself. So luckily I didn't have to. You know, post COVID, I think, here's what I would say is, there's a lot of lessons that we're gonna learn in this great pause. What we're experiencing right now has never been experienced before to this level, where we have a, the world has shut down, never happened before. And there's lessons for us to learn in this, personal lessons, business lessons, um, global community lessons that we need to learn. And I believe that while there's been some terrible, terrible things that have happened because of COVID-19, there's gonna be some positive things that come from this as well. I really believe that. And we will be better for it. I agree 100%. Um, let me ask, Jamie, do you see anything in the chat that I am missing? I've been watching the Q&A mostly. And um, Jamie. There, I, I am the uh, anonymous voice from behind the curtain. <laughs> Who's talking? Back. Is it God? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, this has been a great conversation, by the way, now that I can jump in and, and, and say a few things. I think it's been fantastic. So. Um, there are a few questions. Um, so one is, uh, Lisa, how do you navigate talents that you can do things that you have no experience? Oh, we did that one already, didn't we? Okay, they moved it over. Um, how do you deal with people who, pro who throw up barriers? Oh, happens what every day. What you're trying to accomplish, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, whether people are intentional around it or it's just happenstance that there's barriers that occur. COVID-19, um, you know, you know, you, what, it's, it's all about this grit and persever perseverance and resilience. Um, but more than anything, it must be a mindset. Um, I used to be dismayed when bad things happened. It would, it would throw me off kilter. I'd be knocked off my horse, Right as a jockey. And I'd, I'd get back up and I'd figure out, well, God, how do I prevent getting knocked off my horse? It kind of goes back to one of the previous things that I said is bad things are going to happen. They are expected. You don't know exactly what, but know that it will. So if you know that, then it's going to be less surprising and perhaps be able to, um, if you're expecting it, make sure that you have those scenario plans that if plan A doesn't work, you've, you've got plan B and plan C. Generally, one of those options can work in a particular scenario, even when bad things happen. Mm -hmm. The next thing truly is the best thing. Yeah, back to that plan B and plan C. Anything else, Jamie, or otherwise we can, I think, wrap this up. Um, one last one back to Omcare in general. Uh, Here's a question from Brad. Which EMRs are you integrating with? And are they helping or are you, sorry, sometimes a, the, are they helping or are you integrating through a third party platform? And we did. Yeah, we, we did answer that, that one. one. Um, okay. <clears throat> so just, just as again, um, our product is going to be in pilot later on this year. And we will then start further integration into the um, healthcare systems, electronic networks, and so on and so forth. 
Um, this is going to be primarily driven by our partnerships that are developed. So more soon on that front. Okay, great. Last question here. How many years did it take for you to feel like you have gained momentum during your entrepreneurial journey? What time is it? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> It's an ongoing process. It, just like being a human being, it's, we're unfolding all the time. Um, and there are days, most days, I'm, I'm confident. I absolutely believe that, um, that we're going to be successful and we're going to do what we say we're going to do. But there are some days when it's so hard and there's so many things going against you. Um, here's what I would suggest. I, Sometimes all you can do is believe. Sometimes you just have to hang on to the faith that yes, something's going to work out here. I don't know what it is, but it's going to work out. I have this rock in my car and it's, you know, it's one of those round stones, kind of like one of those meditation stones and it says believe on it. And sometimes all I have is to grab that rock <laughs> and, and hold it because it's gotten so hard that all you can do is just believe. But you know what? That's okay too. But I, as long as you have faith and you have those that are around you that can support you through those really tough times, you can make it, you can do it. That is fantastic. I know I speak for everyone on this call, Lisa. Thank you so very much for sharing your journey, your insights, your inspiration. It's been fantastic. Um, I look forward to yeah, seeing when Care hits the marketplace. I know it's, um, it's something that's of personal interest for sure. Um, to me. So thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. It's, it's, it's been fun. Thank you so much. And Jamie, um, I should have introduced you earlier. I'm sorry. Jamie uh, Sandsback is the community manager with the Collider, a co-working space in Rochester. He's also the technology guru and producer of this um, e-tech talk series. Uh, thanks so much, Jamie, for coordinating all of this and getting us together here today. Um, we have a number of events that are coming up here we wanted to let people be aware of um, before we let everybody go. We have three events. Um, we have the E1 Ignite Cup. It's a startup competition to advance emerging entrepreneurs. That's going to be on May 7 from uh, 5 to 7 p.m. Mark your calendars for that. Also the Walleye Tank, showcasing innovators and community leaders stepping up to conquer COVID-19 challenges. That sounds super interesting. That's on May 15th from three to five. And then our next e-tech talk um, with Brett Broll, founder and managing director of the Syndicate Fund, May 28th at 2 p.m. So please uh, check your calendars and sign up for all those events. I guarantee it's gonna be fun for you. So thank you everybody. I appreciate your, your time today.